Hi, and welcome to In the Studio. I'm Redbeard, bringing you the stories behind the greatest rock albums in history. Today we're in the studio with the duos that blended the melodic elements of jazz with the song structures of rock to give us one of the most popular albums of the 70s. When uh, you're out on a stage um, performing, you're in show business. And uh, I don't think that it was ever uh, Donald's or my intention to be in show business. We wanted to be musicians and to make music. To some degree, we, we wanted to get back to uh, more complex harmony and... Uh, go back to some of the jazz harmony that we'd, we'd grown up with and um, there was also uh, some interesting things happening and uh, with you know what they call fusion hi I'm Walter Becker formerly of Steely Dan I'm Donald Fagan in the studio for Steely Dan's Asia. By 1977, Steely Dan had firmly established themselves as reliable fixtures in the world of rock music. And this was despite the fact that Steely Dan hadn't played live in several years. And the two central characters, Walter Becker and Donald Fagan, did everything they could to avoid becoming pop stars. Almost from its inception in 1972, as a six-piece group, Steely Dan seemed to be in a constant state of flux. By 1975, Steely Dan was officially a duo, bringing in countless sidemen to augment the music of keyboardist and singer Donald Fagan and guitarist bass player Walter Becker. As Steely Dan evolved into simply an outlet for Becker and Fagan's studio fantasies, the achievements kept rolling in. But none of their accomplishments could compare with the eventual success of the album Asia. A J A, which went all the way to number three and lasted on the charts for more than a year. After its release 20 years ago, in September 1977, the album Asia became the first Steely Dan album to sell over a million copies, going on to top the three million mark within a year. Even though they used the same producer and most of the same musicians who had helped them record their preceding album, when it came time to do the album Asia, Steely Dan was ready for a new direction. Here's Donald Fagan. It's it's really hard to say looking back at it, but uh, to some degree we, we wanted to get back to uh, more complex harmony and uh, go back to some of the jazz harmony that we'd, we'd grown up with. And um, there was also uh, some interesting things happening in, uh, with you know what they call fusion. It was the beginning of the fusion era, era between... Uh, there were some... Uh, musicians who seem to be successfully uh, adapting uh, some of the uh, techniques of blues and rock to jazz and vice versa. And um, we hired a lot of those musicians who were um, interested in that fusion. Um, Steve Gadd, who uh, really really invented a new kind of, uh, of drumming, really, uh, in those days. And um, I think uh, the album reflected uh, a sort of... Um, uh, a wish on a lot of a part of a lot of players to do something more sophisticated, more mature, and uh, just uh, you know ex expand the the vocabulary of of, uh, of pop music. And um, aside from perhaps the 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 first album, which um, we were still kind of wondering if we were you know writing pop songs or personal songs in a way, or there was there was still a sort of a uh, the merging of the two. I think uh, after that, we, we really wrote to entertain ourselves. And um, I guess, you know, we got bored with what, what we were doing and wanted to uh, do something different. In the corner, with the release of the album Asia, the word spread on the street that Steely Dan was going on the road for the first time in over three years. And while they did even go so far as to rehearse this planned tour, it was eventually scrapped due to lack of preparation. As Walter Becker told me, Steely Dan always preferred making records over touring anyway. 
the way we did it, uh, we were kind of the auteurs of the uh, record in the sense that a director is the, uh, you know, the author of his film. Uh, you know, and, and no matter what happens, you don't have that on stage. And uh, so maybe it was a little less rewarding than making a record. And also a record is something that lasts, you know, and uh, performance doesn't. So I think that um, as much fun as it is to perform live, and also, and here's another thing. When uh, you're out on a stage um, performing, you're in show business. And uh, I don't think that it was ever uh, Donald's or my intention to be in show business. We wanted to be musicians and to make music. Uh, so performing uh, in, in front of audiences in that particular way that, that you do when you're um, playing in front of five or 10,000 people um, took us a little away from that and uh, was not quite what we had in mind. Avoiding the road wasn't the only thing Steely Dan did to keep as far away from the limelight as possible. According to Donald Fagan, they also purposely kept their faces off of their Steely Dan album covers. We wanted to keep our uh, selves out of out of it as far as um, you know. We we uh, we were trying to sort of avoid any kind of uh, image making, um, really, and. Um, we wanted the music to stand on itself, and it goes along with the whole thing about it, you know our our uh, problem with the spectacle of popular music. I think, and um, you know, I think that probably we were just much too. Uh, I mean, lo looking back on it, uh, you know, we were uh, could have been much looser about the whole whole thing, but uh, you know, that's that's what happens. So. Now, on its 20th anniversary, Steely Dan's Asia album is universally hailed as a benchmark. But even upon its release, Asia was immediately recognized as being superb. Honored with a Grammy Award for Best Engineered Recording, it was virtually faultless, from the sonic quality to the songs to the expert musicianship. With that in mind, I asked Walter Becker if Steely Dan had done anything differently in the studio to make the album Asia. Well, no, it was the same process that we went through every time. And uh, I think, uh, you know, we were very fortunate. We got some uh, really great performances from musicians. Uh, and uh, we took a long time doing it. So things that didn't work out, uh, uh, you know, we, we just kept throwing them away until we got something really special. And uh, that's why it took so long to make that record. And uh, but, you know, in the end, people always came through and 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 did something uh, really wonderful. And uh, it just, you know, sometimes when you go into a studio, you can go into a studio with what you think is a great song and a great bunch of musicians. And for some reason or other, on that particular day, nothing happens, you know, and um, uh, the same bunch of musicians, the same song on another day uh, will be great. And uh having the luxury of taking the days that nothing happens and just saying, well, forget about this. And, uh, you know, we can, we can do better than this. And going back in until you get what you want made it possible to get a very uh, satisfying set of performances from everybody. Ultimately, there were many people responsible for the success of the Asia album from Steely Dan. But one person that Donald Fagan especially remembers for his important contributions to the project is the heralded jazz horn player Tom Scott. We uh, consulted with him about the sort of thing we wanted. Sometimes uh, we'd sing him some lines that we wanted in a, in a certain spot. Um, it was really a collaborative thing. And then he would fill in... Uh, a lot of the the voices, and uh, you know, he's a real expert uh, arranger for for small bands, and um, well, and other, any kind of band really. And um, he took it very uh, seriously and um, tried to do a great job. And um, it came out. I think you know, the the uh, he really knew how to uh, you know m match the kind of harmony that was in the rhythm section. Uh, with the horn charts and it really sounds like it was uh, really of a piece although it, a lot of it wasn't planned um, until the tracks were done but uh, yeah it really did a great job in fact all the musicians did a great job on the album Asia 
All 22 of them. Walter Becker once told me that he believed the reason Steely Dan had evolved into a duo, using so many outside musicians, was because Walter really wasn't a very good jazz player. Now, that's his opinion. Knowing that Walter can be a bit self-critical about his chops, I asked Donald Fagan for his opinion of his former partner's abilities. Self-loathing is really our specialty. Uh, <clears throat> he, is, he is a great guitar player. His... Um, he doesn't have the kind of technique that uh, Barney Kessel or someone has, but he's um, very inventive, and uh, you know his touch is fantastic. And um, you know, I, I I always thought that his solos were were uh, really my my favorites. Even though we, you know, I mean, we we're using the, the best best players in the country, and uh, I think that his uh, uh, even so that his his playing at least stylistically is is so. Uh, perfectly matched to uh, you know what we were trying to do. I guess it's, it's really back to the word attitude. Probably the best example of the incredibly talented musicians that played on the Asia album is the story that Donald Fagan told me of how the title track was recorded in one take. We figured we'd rehearse it for a day because it was, it was quite difficult. But when we got to the studio, uh, the uh, it was this long chart. It must have been six or seven pages. And... Um, we just decided to run it down once, and uh, Steve Gadd is a fantastic, aside from being a fantastic drummer, he's a fantastic sight reader, and um, didn't really need to rehearse, and uh, neither did the rest of the band. They were really good readers, uh, Larry Carlton and, and uh, Michael O'Mardian and um, Chuck Rainey, and they just uh, went through the first take, and, and there was a little mark for, for uh, on the chart for Steve Gadd to ad-lib to a certain part, and uh, or a couple, couple of different different parts, which we figured we'd talk about and so on. But they just ripped through it on the first take, and we just we just took it. Up on the hill. Welcome back in the studio. I'm Donald Fagan of Steely Dan. And I'm Redbeard. This is the 20th anniversary of Steely Dan's Asia album. The album was Steely Dan's sixth, and while each before it had been successful in its own right, Asia became the first record for Steely Dan to sell over a million copies. Typical of Walter Becker's modest personality, he told me he believes they're not necessarily responsible for the album's tremendous success. You know, that was a particular time, uh, if you recall, that's when Fleetwood Mac's uh, Rumors album was out, and uh, that was a particular time when people were just selling lots of records. You know, there's times in the business when a given a hit record will sell X number, and there's other times when, for reasons known and unknown, that same level of hit record will sell 3X or 4X times as many records. And that was one of those times when uh, just you know, you were going to sell twice as many records as you would have sold two years before. Well, the, I, the idea of that song was that a uh, alienated kid in the suburbs who uh, was looking for some sort of alternative values in terms to uh, jazz and uh, hip culture, uh, you know, and it's something to kind of grab onto, and um, the basic idea is there's, there's a kind of culture of, of losers, which you'd sort of rather be part of than sort of the general uh, general way of, of life in America, and, um, you know, they, they've got a name for the winners in the world, um, and uh, the losers should have some sort of uh, franchise as well, <laughs> uh, and the name which he, he has chosen, which conveys a certain power uh, is, is Deacon Blues. As the 70s faded into the 80s and all the music reviewers started tallying up the greatest albums of that decade, Asia was certainly one of those that made it onto nearly every list. Quite an accomplishment. But it becomes even more impressive when you realize the problem Steely Dan was having with ABC Dunhill, their record company at the time. Here's Walter Becker. There was some trepidation at that time about the fact uh, that we wanted, we were trying to renegotiate our deal with these guys, right? 
and um, and we had been in the studio for a long time, and uh, we were a little afraid that at some point they would come in and take the uh, tapes away from us. But uh, as it turned out, uh, nothing like that ever happened. So um, those fears, um, you know, uh, when uh, <laughs> when when people are in the studio and things start to do start to run on a little bit, and um, if there is some sort of um, a failure to communicate going on between the label and the artist, um, you do start to think about, you know, <laughs> what might be a good safe place for the masters, you know, that um, would be known only to yourselves and stuff like that. Donald Fagan. Generally, I, I would say that uh, ABC was, um, they didn't mind the fact that we didn't tour that much because each album sold more records than the last. It seemed like a, the more... Uh, the more uh, invisible we were, the more albums we'd sell. So um, that wasn't much of a problem. I think uh, they complained about the budgets, but um, not that hard. <laughs> not that hard. They they, they realized that, uh, you know, a lot of people go in the studio and, and uh, you know, they'll spend, uh, well, some, some 100000 some 200 and then some uh, half a million dollars and come out with uh, something you can't sell. So if we went in and spent uh, a lot of money... At least they they knew that we'd we'd come out with something good. So um, you know there was some trouble over it, but not that that much. And uh, eventually we uh, got an uh, an offer from Warner Brothers. So uh, we actually signed with them. Uh, I think either dur during while we were making Asia, I think, or just before uh, the idea being we'd have one more album to do and then go over to Warner Brothers. Um, Turned out we had two more to do, uh, and there was a, an oversight about how many we had to do. And um, by the time we got to Warner Brothers, uh, there was no more Steely there. So. Redbeard thanking Steely Dan's Walter Becker and Donald Fagan for giving us the details of the wonderful album Asia in its 20th anniversary year. Special thanks to Gary Gersh. You can email to in the studio at 3net.com or write in the studio at Post Office Box 10307, Burbank, California 91510. In the Studio is a Bullet Production, produced by yours truly Redbeard and written by Jim Nelson. Production assistance and editing by Rick R.J. Lane. The executive producer of In the Studio is Stephen R. Smith.